Good evening. Uh, sorry for the five minute delay. We, we couldn't find parking ourselves. <laughs> we thought the, the room was going to be packed. We couldn't find any parking. Uh, so welcome back. This is our last meeting for this, this academic year. Uh, spring quarter, we have unusual book. It's a little bit outside of the genres that we've been reading, but we thought it would be interesting to explore uh, a novel from the, you know, the 17th century in France, completely different world. But before I introduce our guests and say something about the novel, let me just say something about books. And I want to applaud all of you and all of us who are readers of books, because I think we don't get enough credit for the kind of heroism of reading. <laughs> that it's true. I, that I remember being in Rome um, a few years ago, where after some aggressive hooligan activity for a soccer game, uh, where a lot of people were injured, they decided to hold a very important soccer match in a completely empty stadium in order to avoid further violence, and it was so eerie to watch on television a soccer game in front of an empty stadium with completely silent, and even the players could not play because they were freaked out. And it was a revelation of what the audience for those uh, events bring to the event. And the same thing applies, I think, really to books and to reading, that um, I mean, if, if you look at what is a book in essence, it's just words on a page that are completely dead until a reader animates the words and gives it meaning and re-resurrects the worlds that any good novel really represents. Every novel is a world. And uh, I happen to believe that books are the greatest gift that the dead have given us even more than our laws and our institutions. And in that respect, I think back at, uh, I think back to a scene from the Odyssey where Odysseus has to go and visit the dead in order to find out how to get back home and how to bring peace to the kingdom. And he uh, arrives at the opening of Hades, but in order to call forth the dead, from their underworld, he, um, he has to sacrifice a number of sheep and a, and a famous black ram. So he orders his men to create a groove and a, a kind of ditch. And he, the, the blood of the sacrificed uh, animals kind of flows in there. And it's that blood that calls the dead out of uh, Hades. And it's only after they drink of that blood that they're able to speak and tell Odysseus what he needs to know. So he speaks to his mother, he speaks to Tiresias and all the great heroes. And that's always struck me as something that what readers do when they um, open a book and read it. Namely, we give our blood, our spirit, life to animate uh, otherwise dead words on a page by being those who receive the, uh, the actual words of the, of the authors. And in that sense, uh, all these works that come to us from the past, and this is, after all, a book series called Another Look, and almost all the authors that we've read over the years have, have been dead authors, but they live again thanks to you. So I want you all to applaud yourselves and us for the, uh, the kind of rescue mission that we're involved in in reading the books, okay? And having said that, let me just um, introduce our speakers because I'm not going to say anything about La Princesse de Cleve until I hear what, what they have to say about it. Uh, Chloe Edmondson is, uh, talk about blood, I think she has Stanford in her blood because she was an undergraduate here at Stanford and now she's finishing a PhD in 18th century French literature here in the uh, Department of French and Italian. And I'm very pleased that it's the first time we have, we've had a, uh, a graduate student uh, participating in um, another look, and I think it's high time that we hear from one. She is a PhD candidate, as I mentioned, in the Department of French and Italian. She specializes in French literary and cultural history, 17th and 18th century, actually, 
with particular focus on letter writing practices. She's published in the Journal of Modern History and the Digital Humanities Quarterly, and most recently she co-edited a volume entitled Networks of Enlightenment, Digital Approaches to the Republic of Letters, as forthcoming with the series Oxford University Studies and the Enlightenment in this June. Pierre Saint-Amand is also has a little bit of Stanford in his blood because when I first arrived here in the 80s, Pierre Saint-Amand was a, an assistant professor in his second year here at Stanford, and that's where we first met. And then he decided to pick up and leave and go to Brown University where he spent um, a number of years. And he has since moved on to Yale University and where he is the Benjamin Barge Professor of French where, and he teaches um, the literature and philosophy of the French Enlightenment. He's written a number of books. I'll just mention his first book is on Diderot. It was published in 1984. As far as I know, Pierre is the youngest PhD. <laughs> you know, I don't know how old you were when you got your PhD. I think you're probably one of the youngest in this, uh, in your early 20s or something. It, almost like Nietzsche. Nietzsche who got his a professorship at Basel, I think at the age of 24. Not quite, but he's close. Uh, so that first book is 1984. I mean, that's, he's a young man, so you can imagine how young he was when he published that. It was followed by another book called The Libertine's Progress, Seductions in the 18th Century Novel, 1994. And his most recent book, probably my favorite, is called The Pursuit of Laziness, an idle interpretation of the Enlightenment. Great book, which uh, is a study of the resistance to the ideology of work at the dawn of capitalism. We can use a little bit of that counter ideology here in Silicon Valley for sure. Uh, he's also edited um, two erotic novels of the 18th century, and we're looking forward to hearing what Pierre has to say about La Princesse de Clèves tonight, coming all the way from Yale. But we're going to start first with Chloe, and then uh, we'll hear from Pierre, and then we'll open up the discussion. Well, good evening to everyone, and thank you, Robert, for the introduction and the invitation to be a part of this event tonight, talking about La Princesse de Clèves, which happens to be one of my favorite books in the French literary canon. Here in the United States, this book might seem like a bit of a foreign choice. You may be familiar with other French classics like Flaubert's Madame Bovary, or perhaps Proust's In Search of Lost Time, but you may never have heard of Madame de Lafayette until this event here, and especially because the book was written in the late 17th century. To the French, though, it's as much of a national treasure and classic as, say, Mark Twain's Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, perhaps even more so as the following example will show. The book actually had a huge resurgence of popularity in 2009 when the president, Sarkozy, publicly disparaged the book. <laughs> he was talking about the entrance exam for public sector workers and how it included questions about Lafayette's book, which he thought was absurd. He thought it was ridiculous to ask a metro ticket clerk what they thought of La Princesse de Clèves, and also equally ridiculous that candidates should have a knowledge of it. He even added that in his school days, he had, quote, suffered greatly by the princess. <laughs> it turns out, though, that these comments became a full-blown scandal, and the French people took to defending the book as a pillar of their national culture and heritage, a book that should be read and appreciated by everyone, and never mocked as irrelevant. So following these comments, there were university strikes in 2009, which gave rise to marathon public readings of the book throughout <laughs> the country. Publishers saw sales of the book double within the year, and a book fair in Paris that year even sold out of over 2,000 pins that said, I read La Princesse de Clèves, and this year the princess will vote. <laughs> so who was the author to whom this book is attributed that the French care so much about almost four centuries later? Born in 1634 to a family of minor but wealthy nobility, Marie-Madeleine Pioche de Lavergne becomes, in 1651, maid of honor to Queen Anne of Austria. And this initiates her entree into high society and court life. It's also during this time that she first became involved in the literary world of the 17th century, 
going to salons of Madame de Rambouillet, Madame de Scudéry, and becoming friends with Madame de Sévigné, all of whom were important literary figures of the time, and notably female. In 1655, she married François Moutier, Comte de Lafayette, with whom she has two sons, and she lives with him in the countryside until her permanent return to Paris in 1660. And that's when she starts her own literary salon. So she starts welcoming some of the most important authors of the time into her home regularly, including, for instance, uh, the Duc de la Rochefoucauld, who she became close friends with. And he introduced her to many others, Jean Segre, uh, the great playwright Racine. And so it's perhaps unsurprisingly, she starts to write around this time. In 1678, La Princesse de Clèves is published anonymously, but it is quickly thought to be attributed to Lafayette. Although if you read the introduction in this volume, you'll see that this authorship is contested. There's theories that it was a collaboration between Lafayette and La Rochefoucauld and Sudre, um, and this is still somewhat debated. At the time of its publication, the book, though, was a source of literary scandal. And it was really a question of genre. People just did not know how to categorize what seemed to be a very unique text. It combined elements of two of the popular genres of the time, the romance and the historical novella. So romances were generally set in a time and place distant from the authors. They tended to have heroic plots, very implausible events, and elements of fantasy, whereas the the historical novella was set in the recent past with historical characters, and these characters tended to conform to social expectations. So the issue with La Princesse de Clèves, which was set in the court of Henry II in the mid-16th century, is that it would seem to favor realism. But readers believed that the characters did not conform to how people would really behave especially because of what seemed to be exceptionally strange behavior on the part of the heroine. In particular, her confession to her husband of her feelings for another man. And around the time of its publication, there was actually a poll in a f popular literary magazine, the Mercure Galant, which was asking people to write in to see if, you know, what they thought, if anyone would ever behave like, like the princess did. Today, one of the big scholarly debates about the book also has to do with genre, namely whether or not it signaled the birth of the modern novel as we know it. Regardless, I think that we can appreciate that it holds qualities that will become essential and characteristic of the types of books that we consider to be novels today, works that give readers access to the inner thoughts and emotions of the characters over an extended period of time. Indeed, if we look at the history of the work's reception, even in the 17th century, her contemporary critics agreed, such as Jean-Baptiste Vanacourt, that the book captured, quote, what happens in the depths of our hearts, the expression of things that all have experienced. So how does Lafayette do this? And what exactly is new with respect to the representation of emotions in La Princesse de Clèves when thinking about the history of fiction writing? Love has always been a primary theme of literature, especially in French literature. In the Middle Ages, we have the Arthurian romances, these tales of knights like Lancelot undertaking exploits to earn the hearts of their ladies. What is new in La Princesse de Clèves is this sustained and transparent narration of a character's emotions over an extended period of time in a narrative that comes to have emotion and psychological movements as the primary intrigue, as opposed to actions and events. One of the defining aspects of the text, as you may have noticed, is this accumulation of information that we as readers gain about the emotions of the characters. And I like to think of it as a sort of Bildungsroman, a, a story that takes the arc of an emotional education or emotional journey. So now I'm going to draw our attention to a few key phases of this emotional education. So in part one, the narrator makes clear just how ignorant of love and passion the princess is in the beginning of the book. So Monsieur de Clèves calls her out on her blushes, which he says come from a sense of modesty, not from a movement of the heart. And the narrator 
then emphasizes that these distinctions were beyond the princess's comprehension. Once she meets Nemur, however, and her feelings start to develop, the reader receives information around the, sa uh, the same way as the other characters. So, so certain characters start to notice that she has a bit of a preference for Nemur. So for instance, the Chevalier de Guise notices a slight inner turmoil in her face that made him believe that she had been affected by the sight of the princess. And her mother notices the way that she sings Nemur's praises. But the crucial turning point in the narrative comes when the princess herself becomes aware of these feelings. So this happens when Madame de Chartres purposefully insinuates that Nemour is having an affair with Madame la Dauphine. Her mother tells her this to test her theory that her daughter is starting to have feelings for Nemour. And so on page 37, it reads, it is impossible to express the pain she felt on discovering her own interest in Monsieur de Nemour. She had not yet dared to confess it to herself. She saw then that the feelings she had for him were those that Monsieur de Clèves had so often asked of her. From that point on in the narrative, the majority of the story will concern these prolonged descriptions of conflicting inner thoughts and emotions. And an especially important scene for this comes with the misplaced letter, where she mistakes this letter as belonging to Nemours and thinks that he had an affair with someone else. And this is the first time that the princess ever experiences these feelings of jealousy and betrayal. And so she kind of continues to read it, you know, very, you know, re repeatedly, and then she has a sleepless night. And even once all of that's resolved, in the aftermath of the letter, she continues to contemplate on this experience of jealousy. So consider in the following passage on page 91 to 92, the many complex emotions involved as she reflects on how she felt when she thought that Nemours was in love with another woman and also as she reflects on her difficult situation. So it reads, what was more intolerable to her than anything was the memory of the state in which she had passed the night, the dreadful pain she had suffered at the thought that Monsieur de Nemours was in love with another woman. She had been ignorant until then of the deadly torments that sprang from distrust and jealousy they opened her eyes to the risk of being deceived. She felt that it was almost impossible for her to find happiness in his love. But even if I could, she said to herself, what can I want with it? Do I really want to tolerate it? Respond to it? Am I ready to embark on a love affair? To be unfaithful to Monsieur de Clèves? To be unfaithful to myself? Do I wish to expose myself to the cruel remorse and mortal sufferings that love gives rise to? So this is just one of many scenes where the narrative brings us inside the princess's head. And we get both a description of her thoughts and her feelings. So we have, just in this one passage, we have suffering, we have pain, we have distrust, jealousy, deception. We have this new prospect that she forms in her head that she could never be happy being in love with Nemours. And then we get a series of rhetorical questions where she starts to ask herself you know, the many questions concerning her predicaments, and they, that which reveals her conflicting feelings and thoughts. And so this happens again and again in the novel. There's many scenes like this. There's many kind of series of questions and internal monologues. As in the above example, events in the plot, like the misplaced letter, often give rise to these lengthy emotional debates. But ultimately, the characters tend to choose to not act at all. So the princess's conclusion at the end of this scene is to tear herself away from Nemours and to go to the countryside. So what drives the narrative are not actions and events, but rather these instances of emotional deliberation, where we see the deepening of feelings, these conflicting thoughts, but no real actions or pursuits is, take, is taking place. Her primary imp impulse indeed is one of retreating from society, or in other words, from Nemours. And yet, interestingly, it's in these moments of retreat from society that we often get more information about her feelings because she gains the space and time to reflect on her emotions and indulge these emotions. And this again allows feelings and emotions to take center stage in the novel. So one example of this is when the king is dying. As readers, we don't get much information about this very significant event. Instead, on page 118, the narrative reads, she stayed at home, hardly thinking of the great change that was about to take place. 
Her mind was full of thoughts of her own, and she was now free to give her undivided attention to these. And similarly, when she goes to Coulommiers to the countryside, she creates for herself this very solitary life where she spends her time gazing at the representation of Nemours in the tableau that she had commissioned, absorbed in, quote, amusing fascination that could only have been inspired by true passion. And so this ultimate act of retreat, however, comes in the end of the novel, in part four. When the princess is finally free to be with Nemours as a widow, she still renounces passion and chooses retreat. And so in contrast to the first three parts of the novel, the end brings us to this climax where for the first time, Nemours and the princess have an actual conversation about their feelings and about their predicament. And so one way that I like to think about the ending is that it signals the end of the princess's emotional education. We started with her being completely ignorant of love and passion. Then we had a prolonged internal conflict where she grappled with her emotions and her situation. And then finally, we have this very important conversation where she communicates how she feels, but she also takes this final decision. And so we see the fruits of this lengthy internal conflict. And up until the very end of the book, the reader is drawn into this rich interior world and we witness a character's emotional journey through this sustained narration of her thoughts and feelings over an extended period of time. And this is both something that is new in the 17th century and also a key characteristic of what will become the genre of the novel as we know it. So just in conclusion, I'd love to propose that we discuss this choice of retreat further in when we have time for conversation and you know, hear your thoughts on this. Why does the princess choose to, to you know, give us this very unsatisfying ending? And why does she choose her repos, which it says in the French, or her tranquility and peace of mind? And then another avenue that we could perhaps discuss would also be the representation of the emotions of the other characters like Nemours and Monsieur de Sèvres, because we also get some very rich detail about that. Excellent. Thank you. Chloe Edmondson from my own department. <laughs> yes, uh, well, thank you, uh, Robert, for inviting me here. Um, it's always nice to uh, get a chance to come back to paradise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and actually, it's, it's fitting that I speak of uh, the Princesse de Clèves because it, it, it's one of the books that I first taught here uh, at Stanford. So, uh, so back to the scene of the crime. Uh, in a way, uh, we could consider uh, La Princesse de Clèves, uh, and you won't be surprised that I take this, this uh, way to examine the novel, a repented libertine novel with a Christian ending. Um, I say that because uh, one, one could consider opposite the couple of the princess and Nemours, another uh, couple in a, in a novel which actually dominates, dominates it, that of the, of the king, uh, Henry II, Henri II, and the uh, Duchesse de Valentinois, Diane de Poitiers. They constitute the couple that uh, sort of sets up the model of relations in the court away from the conjugal uh, legitimate uh, relations. Madame de Lafayette uh, was keen in, as well, uh, to distribute uh, across the novel, a number of subplots of stories, and, and many of them uh, have in common uh, the uh, plot of galanterie. And I'll say a, few, a little more about, about that word, which um, is, is not really translatable, and uh, the uh, translator in the novel, uh, Terence Cave, had some difficulty actually uh, doing so. He proposes a word that I actually don't like at all, but uh, I will uh, say just a bit more uh, after uh, to about that. Uh, and I will return to these uh, subplots uh, a little later. But let me say again something about, about the Libertine uh, novel. Uh, uh, one of the episodes that uh, Chloe spoke about, uh, which is the, the Coulommier episode that you, you, you have read, uh, the episode where uh, Nemours uh, surprises the princess uh, in her garden is, is a scene that will return to many uh, 
liberty novels in the 18th century as uh, a scene of uh, voyeurism uh, and, uh, and at the same time a scene of uh, auto-eroticism in the part of the, uh, of the princess, of Madame de Cleve, uh, in the pavilion. As, as you may remember, she is examining a, a painting uh, where Nemours is portrayed and um, all of the elements of, uh, of eroticism are there. She, there is a daybed, uh, disheveled hair, uh, and, uh, and a prop. Uh, the uh, famous cane came from India. Uh, I think the translation of, of your of Terence Kiff says the, the Malacca cane, uh, and uh, and and most of all, nighttime that uh, sort of envelops uh, the uh, princess with uh, darkness and her desire. Uh, but uh, let's take a minute uh, uh, on uh, that first the first sentence of the novel that describes the court as a fairyland. Um, she writes, uh, I think, Madame de Lafayette, the display of courtly magnificence and manners. In French, it's uh, la magnificence et la galanterie. And uh, the translator renders the word galanterie with manners. Uh, although in the notes, he uh, provides, among other meanings, love affair, love affairs. And I believe, actually, that is the more adequate uh, meaning. You know, but as I said before, galanterie is almost untranslatable. This is the same way that libertinage, uh, the French word, is almost uh, un un untranslatable, you know, and, uh, this allows, especially Americans, the American Puritans, to uh, blame the French uh, <laughs> with the affairs of, of the sex. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, the court is div divided between the network of marital and political alliances and those love affairs that populate uh, the novel like uh, a busy underworld. Um, in fact, the narrator reframes and recasts the novel in, these, in those terms. Uh, when on page 14, uh, we read, ambition and love affairs were the lifeblood of the court. Love was entangled with politics and politics with love. Everyone was busy by pleasure and intrigue. And the narrator explains further, a state of rivalry and mutual envy existed between, the, between different factions. In this way, uh, the narrator continues, there reigned at court a kind of orderly unrest. Uh, and, and this is the situation in which the princess and Nemours find themselves from the start. Uh, the, the princess is particularly, one could say, pulled out of her marriage with the, with the Prince de Clèves by no other than the king. In, in a remarkable scene that I hope you, you would have appreciated, you have appreciated the scene of the ball when Nemours and, and the princess are thrown into each other's arms, uh, uh, which, becomes the, which, make, which, marks, which is marked as the beginning of their liaison and under the eyes of of everyone. This meeting itself uh, proves the result of an impossible logic of attraction in the novel. It is uh, the point of contact, I would say, of hyperbolic beauty uh, from both sides of the gender divide. Uh, for for Nemours, uh, uh, he's, he's described as th the most handsome and agreeable man. Uh, uh, even better, uh, nature's masterpiece. Can't get better than that. And in the case of the of the princess, uh, uh, she is uh, uh, presented as a, a young woman so beautiful that all eyes turn to gaze upon her. And it's worth reading 
about about the ball. This, the the scene of the I would say the blast of their uh, encounter. And uh, allow me to get to it. Uh, page twenty nine. Page 23, sorry. Um, Madame de Cleve finished dancing, and while she was looking round to find someone she intended to take as a partner, the king called to her to take the person who, has just, who had just arrived. She turned and saw a man who she felt at once could be no better, no other than uh, Monsieur de Nemours stepping over a chair to make his way to where the dancing was. It's quite quite an exercise. Uh, he had such presence that it was difficult not to be taken aback on seeing him when one had never seen him before, especially that evening when care he had taken to dress elegantly, when the care he had taken to dress elegantly added still more luster to his appearance. But it was also difficult to see Madame de Cleve for the first time without being amazed. So this is the reason why I, I see this scene as a kind of blast. Um, and it's not, I don't think it's exaggerated to say that. Uh, this dance realizes uh, the, the crossing of also of, the, of parallel lines of desire. Nemours and the princess are uh, the most desired in the court. Uh, and the text mentions uh, the, the followers of, of the princess. Aside from the husband, uh, Monsieur de Cleve, we, we have Nemours, of course, but we also have the Chevalier de Guise uh, and uh, the Duc de Montpensier. Those are the, the few ones that are um, sort of after, uh, after her. The same goes for Nemours, although, you know, it's, it's more tricky to speak of his, of his uh, amorous uh, reputation because uh, although he is known to have many lovers, many mistresses, um, for some reason, they remain invisible. Um, uh, but the text says about him, uh, he was so kind-hearted and had such a natural inclination for amorous affairs that he could not refuse to pay some attention to those who tried to please him. Thus, he had several mistresses, but it was difficult to guess what he really loved, you know, he's one of these sort of mysterious French lovers. Um, uh, 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 further in the, in the novel, it, 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 we, 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 we learned that he had countless mistresses. Uh, and, and supposedly, uh, to the love for the princess puts a stop to uh, the chain of women uh, uh, that he's had, uh, and she, we, we could say, has, uh, had man has managed to replace all of them in a feat of uh, arresting uh, seduction. Um, maybe one more quote. Uh, Monsieur de Nemours' passion for Madame de Cleve was from the beginning so violent that it spoiled his taste for all the women he had loved. Uh, it even, the text adds, erased them from his memory. <laughs> so uh, let me return to those subplots that I mentioned that are uh, that constitute the the the, the that lay uh, uh, the uh, libertine uh, uh, intrigue uh, of the novel. Uh, one of them is and one of the first ones is the story of Madame de Valentinois, you know the the, the king's uh, mistress. Um, It is interesting uh, 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 as, it, as it mixes uh, 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 um, a number of love affairs from, from her. Uh, she starts actually with the, the former king, the, the father of Henry II. Uh, and uh, all of that uh, with uh, Henry II started, uh, the novel tells us, as an uh, uh, education of a shy a king, and it's basically the, uh, although that's, that's not entirely uh, clear, but um, the, the father um, um, distinguishes the uh, Duchesse de Valentinois to uh, 
uh, takes care of, uh, of, uh, her, uh, of uh, his son. Uh, but there, there, are other, uh, there is another lover which is mentioned in that story, which is the uh, Maréchal de Brissac, uh, whom the king is uh, very uh, jealous of. Then there is another story uh, which is narrated by a deceived future husband about a woman named Madame de Tournon. And um, it's a story that, en that entangles a, a number of concurrent uh, liaisons. One man, Sancerre, another one, Estoudeville. And, and, and they both, uh, in that uh, short story, um, suffer uh, in, in common uh, uh, bereavement and, uh, and jealousy. Then there is a story of, uh, um, of a man who becomes actually the, uh, a lover of the queen. You know, she is upset, of course, that, uh, about the relationship that uh, uh, the king has with the Duchesse de Valentinois, but she ends up with um, the Vidame de Chartres. Um, and, but uh, the Vidame has a, almost like Nemours, a, a number of, uh, of mistresses, a long chain of conquest. And among them, as I just said, the queen, but Madame de Temine, uh, about, le about, the le about which le letter we, we spoke uh, before, uh, another woman that remains, um, I think, interestingly, not named, uh, and, uh, and then another one again, Madame de Martigues. And um, the way the, the story is uh, recounted, we can see how those women serve a screen for, uh, as a screen for another. Um, and um, uh, as, as I mentioned uh, before, the queen herself uh, be, uh, uh, becomes, uh, enters a, a relationship with uh, the uh, uh, Vidam, the Vidam de Chartres. In this court of no difference, of non-difference, with everyone resembling one another, uh, Galantry uh, operates as the uh, equalizer uh, with one affair copying the other. Uh, the relations are imitations, and this is for Cynthia, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the replication of love objects uh, is the expression of that phenomenon. And um, this is uh, what uh, Madame de Cleve wants to avoid at all costs, although uh, she does not quite uh, succeed. Her, her horror, as you, as you have read, her anguish is uh, by falling for Nemours to resemble the women of the court and to lose her, uh, what she wants to claim, uh, her badge of uh, distinction and of uh, difference. And uh, this is a challenge that uh, she actually sees stronger than uh, her marital vows uh, in, uh, in, and her uh, sacred uh, marriage. Uh, she wants to be singular in a world of sameness and she wants her story to be uh, original. She says, that's in page 110, there could be no other story like mine in the world, no other woman capable of doing such a thing. Um, Confessing to the husband. Uh, addressing uh, that to, uh, I would have to look uh, to tell you the truth. Uh, yeah. it, it, no one, no other woman would confess to her husband. Uh, uh, yeah, that's right. It's, it's about addressing the, yeah, addressing the husband, exactly. Uh, when the husband accuses her of having a, a, a liaison with, uh, with Nemours. Um, the uh, princess's rejection of Nemours is based uh, on uh, this, the same verdict of non-difference. Uh, Nemours, in the eyes of the princess, never rises to singularity. His actions make him again in her eyes, comparable to all men. And uh, at, at the end of the novel, it is the prediction of, uh, uh, of this non-difference 
that uh, seals uh, his fate, as uh, you may remember. You have already had, the princess says, says to Nemours, a number of passionate uh, uh, attachments. You would have others. You would have others, she tells him, to um, reject him uh, in the end. And, and, and indeed, we know that uh, in the end, that uh, the novel tells us, time quenched his passion, Nemours' passion, in validating uh, uh, the uh, mad promise of eternity and visage by the princess and um, brandished uh, by her. I should say a word uh, about marriage um, that I mentioned earlier uh, at the beginning of my remarks. Uh, marriage that the princess exhibits as uh, her ultimate reason for celibacy. She says to Nemours that Monsieur de Cleve, hmm, the husband she practically cheated upon, was perhaps the only man she only speaks in those terms of singularity. Uh, Monsieur de Cleve was perhaps the only man in the world capable of remaining in love with the woman he had married. That's on page 148. Though she recognizes, she recognizes not offering him any passion in return. Uh, indeed, we know that um, in the course of Cleves, uh, 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 we, we know that that is the, 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 the case of Cleves' uh, enduring uh, suffering. He keeps asking uh, Madame de Cleves in his marriage, in their marriage, for more. It's, it's, it's a word that, that returns uh, 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 many times in the uh, dialogue between, between husband and wife. He keeps saying to her, I want, basically, I want more. Um, what is this more uh, uh, out of the uh, conjugal uh, uh, restrictions? What, what we can say bluntly is that the marriage of Cleve and uh, Mademoiselle de Chartres uh, is uh, one without libido, without sex. Uh, that is the abyss of uh, uh, that uh, uh, unsatisfactory union that makes it a, a wreckage, uh, an empty contract uh, that leaves uh, the princess vulnerable to the seduction of another. Uh, the princess only offers, she says, or the, or the novel tells us, the terms of kindness, and she never gets to the beyond, which is another word that is used, more beyond uh, uh, desired by uh, her uh, husband. But in order to reject Nemours, the princess revives, at the end of the novel, the phantom of the dead husband. And, and the words that are used are, are, are quite remarkable. That grim spectacle, uh, she says, uh, 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 that uh, inhibits uh, all a decision with regard to the uh, rival lover. She envelops herself uh, in the end to images of death. You, you, you spoke of death at the beginning, so here we are, uh, right, right there. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, 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 she envelops herself in, in, in the end of the novel to a, a number of images of death, of the dead husband, uh, as uh, she contemplates the, the, the death of desire. Since her uh, mantra becomes duty suddenly at the end of the novel, we could add that another dead phantom uh, of her imagination is the mother, Madame de Chartres, uh, uh, sort of this oracle of law that uh, the daughter fails so ostensibly. Um, that, that's it. <laughs> so I found it interesting that both the, both uh, of you, at least in the first half of your comments, Pierre, and, and throughout Chloe's, that there was a 
a strong emphasis on textual detail and going through it carefully because you know it's it's not been typical of our discussions to focus uh, this closely on how something unfolds you know textually but I think would you agree that in this novel it's absolutely essential that all these nuances and subtleties in the behavior and of the characters in what the narrator uh, says about them that this is part of the, the this is part of the reality of the court where we're talking about a very closed even claustrophobic environment where people's secrets, and neither of you has really talked about the role of secrets in, in the novel, but secrets are intimated or mm, perhaps suggested or revealed in some cases by the subtlest gestures, the blushing, uh, the sense of nervousness and, and, and other indiscretions. So it, it, I think the closest thing we have in English is probably Henry James, and he was dealing not so much with French subjects, but it, it, it's this incredible subtlety which makes it impossible to read this uh, novel, correct me if I'm wrong, just for its plot, because you miss everything. The plot is, is not really where it's at. It's, it's in the nuances. Do you, would you say so, Chloe? Oh, absolutely. And I think that um, you also are talking about these subtleties and these kind of secrets that slip out. And I think that that's one of the big problems for the Princesse de Sèvres throughout the novel, because as she kind of falls more in love with Nemours, she there are all these passages that talk about how she loses control of her, of her facial expressions and of her right. reactions. And then those end up betraying to other characters, to Nemours, to the, the Chevalier de Guise, you know, how she really feels. And so this becomes a constant tension where she's trying to, to hide the secret but then it constantly gets betrayed. And, and it really isn't those subtleties. And there's even passages where it's talking about, you know, she couldn't control her face, but luckily, you know, the Dauphine was looking the other way. And so she kind of, she doesn't manage to hide it, but then, you know, by chance, it doesn't get noticed. So Pierre, would you say that maintaining secrecy seems to be a code among this noblesse, but at the same time, the whole class of the aristocrats, th they're erotically bonded, all of them. And therefore, having a secret means necessarily that you have to reveal it at least to someone, otherwise you're not playing along with the rules. Because it's, a, a, your affair is everyone's affair, no? But it has, to ha it has to be communicated secretly in a network that's kind of a little under the surface. But this is what's so scandalous about the princess is that she doesn't want to play that game. Yeah. They, they, you know, they can be always become open secrets. You know, that's another uh, another aspect in the novel. But, but yeah, it, but secret works as a kind of uh, in this novel as a kind of technology. I would say uh, that uh, allows um, al allows relationships to to be screens right. uh, 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 for the uh, wider. Uh, community and uh, and 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 therefore um, uh, the the um, multiplication of uh, of lovers and affairs can only happen on the basis that you know you don't know. Yeah. And when you were talking about the indifferentiation that almost yes. everyone resembles each other in the fact that first you get married and then you look for a lover and then you you know. And the interchangeability, because you were mentioning before, not, not now, y uh, when we were talking, is that the letter. The oh, yeah. The and I actually have, have yeah. something to add about that, that letter, which, which, uh, uh, which is a li just a little bit different from what you, you've said, although what you said, it, I think, is essential. But uh, this is one of the, you, you mentioned the suffering, the fact that she identifies with uh, not knowing who 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 is the desti uh, destinataire, who is the recipient of the letter, uh, she identifies with uh, with the, the the lady. But it is this episode is is, is evolves in the novel in, in a strange way. By um, this is the one rare episode where they we know that they end up learning the letter uh, by heart. And they they rewrite it 
they imitate uh, 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 the handwriting. And it's one rare episode of bliss, of blissful moment between the two of them uh, as they commune to uh, re rewrite uh, 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 the, uh, 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 that, that uh, infamous letter. And um, so it's substitutability. Right? Ex exactly. So, uh, so Monsieur de Monsieur de Nemours and uh, and and her become uh, com uh, com complicit uh, actors uh, in this uh, play of uh, of uh, interchangeability. Right. You know, but it, it's a rare moment in the novel of of gloom and and suffering. Affliction is the word that uh, is used by Madame de Lafayette. Uh, affliction. But it, it's one, one very rare moment of lightness of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, and, of, and of pleasure where they, they, they don't do much, but at least, you know, uh, 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 the only libidinal thing that they do is that they copy. Copy, the word says, several times, this, uh, this uh, letter. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you, you can make whatever you want with this. But uh, you know, uh, obviously, as a as a Girardian, I I, I ran with that. <laughs> and what's funny about that scene as well is that when Nemours arrives to try to convince the princess that it was not a letter addressed to him, he's happy to see how upset she is because he realizes that oh, she must really have feelings for me. So he kind of goes That's through right. this moment where he almost doesn't want. He wants to prolong. The, you know, the time of her thinking that it was his letter so that he can kind of enjoy this moment of this confirmation of her feeling. Yeah, and there's three of them involved in the, in the copying of the letter. The husband is actually there in the house. It's it basically under, the, under his eyes that the, 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 that la, the princess and Nemours are, uh, are writing. En tête à tête <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> yeah. It's certainly another, a completely different world than uh, the one that we inhabit, and I just find find it um, See. amazing <laughs> that that we can actually um, read and enjoy and appreciate a novel that takes us into uh, a world that we can't recognize as our own at all, and yet at the same time there has to be something in there that we can actually um, feel as something that pertains to us, you know, in, insofar as we're human, even though we would never be in that context. I had the indecency of thinking as I was rereading uh, to prepare for here, uh, the, the, the especially the beginning, you know, when Ma Madame Mademoiselle de Chartres is brought to the court. That I said, I said, this is like the Bachelorette. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's here, here you are. There are all these men for you. You know, uh, you'll get one eventually. <laughs> but um, well, you know, we we actually warned you all about the first 20, 30 pages that bear with it because you go into this novel not knowing who is who and who are all these people, and you say, but, but in a certain sense, that reflects the experience of the young. Um, uh, the young princess, yeah. Young princess who she, she's thrown into a situation where she doesn't know who's who, and, uh, and it's very bewildering. So the reader's experience is, is uh, mm -hmm. reenacting her. her yeah, her and, and in, in, in a sense, you know, I mean, it, it, yeah, if we were, if we were uh, uh, serious readers, you know, we would really try to identify who, who these people are and try to establish, you know, what, what is the difference between them. But in the end, you know, it doesn't matter really because they're supposed to be they're supposed to be look lookalikes, all of them. So, um, sort of this effect of homogeneity and interchangeability, you know, is is rendered by this uh, uh, this uh, absence of uh, of focus on uh, on singular uh, traits from one person and another. So, Chloe, do you agree with Pierre that the primary motivation of the princess is to distinguish herself from everyone else in court by renouncing the possibility of having a, a love affair or even marrying the Duke? You know, I, hadn't, I hadn't thought about it quite in those terms of singularity, and I, I think you're right in, this, in the way in which even in the scene of the confession, she, she states that herself, that that's kind of her goal, is she wants to, to be different, she wants to not succumb to these feelings. But I think that 
you know, the ending complicates things so much because on the one hand, you have this kind of quest for singularity. You also have the influence of, as you said, kind of the dead specter of the mother and her very strong moral education, which is rendered even more dramatic because on the mother's deathbed, she, you know, begs her daughter to not succumb to the same, you know, the same weaknesses of all other women. And really because the mother wants to kind of ensure her happiness. But in the end, I mean, I think that when she's having this discussion with Nemour and the, you know, she says herself that the, the kind of specter of duty to her dead husband would be feeble indeed if it wasn't for her certainty of her unhappiness. And so I think that there is this way in which, you know, I think Lafayette really penetrates the female psyche and these very lengthy reasons that she lays out for the princess's reasoning and this idea that, you know, once married, you know, can, I think she says, you know, can I hope for a miracle in my favor that my husband will continue to love me? And she kind of looks at Nemours past history and she's just so convinced that it, it will lead to her misery. So you see it as a novel, well, this ethic of renunciation is, it's, uh, I don't know, Cynthia, is this what René called for, y that you renounce mimetic desire and, and that you just kind of withdraw from it? And you think it's Girardian? You don't think, yeah? yeah. Yeah, no. We're, t we're alluding, you know, <laughs> Cynthia wrote this biography of René Girard, our colleague who, who his theory of, <laughs> what's that? It's for sale out there. Yes, it's, it's for sale out there. <laughs> and we've, we've mentioned him a few times. It's hard to discuss any novel without uh, seeing mimetic desire and mimetic rivalry at work, especially in this one. But the idea is that, um, and Pierre has a certain sympathy with Girard. Do you think that her decision is to get out of the mimetic entanglement? Yeah, I think she, 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 she leaves the uh, mimesis of seduction to a different, a different one, uh, mimesis of virtue, right. uh, by uh, leaving uh, uh, th those uh, models of, uh, of libertinage to, uh, to at least you know, two other models actually blended in, in, in one, uh, the, husband, the dead husband and the mother. And when she uses the word duty at the end of the novel, the only, the only other place where you find, you find duty is in the episode of the mother. So there is an echo because she suddenly mentions duty, you know, with uh, Nemours. And the last time the, the, the word was used is, was with the mother. I checked. Uh, I don't have the pages in front of me. So, so her going to a convent ha does not have a religious motive. So it's not that she's turning to God. She is just renouncing this, the libertinage of the court, right? Well. It's not imitatio Christi. It's not just tr withdrawing from the game. I think she doubts her fortitude. I think there's a, even after the conversation with Nemo, I think there's a passage where she talks about how you know, she wasn't sure if she really could resolve herself to, you know, not, you know, give in to a man who loves her and who, who she loves. And I think that there's also the element which we haven't really discussed of the end where she also um, gets sick. And so, and that, so there's this kind of other element where it's saying that, you know, when she was sick, she kind of just got more detached from the world, you know, material things, um, which kind of makes you wonder, you know, had she not gotten sick, would she have had the fortitude to resist? Go ahead. Yeah, that microphone doesn't seem to be working, you know? Do you have it on? Yeah. Huh? It's now work. Ah. There we go. <laughs> it is. <laughs> well, it's interesting that Deceit, Desire, and the Novel describes five novels, Close which uh, the Deceit, Desire, and the Novel, Renee's first book in 1961, the five novels he studies conclude with a character's self-renunciation, usually on the deathbed of their ego and the things like that. I guess with um, the Princess de Cleve, um, is it really a self-renunciation? Does she realize that she's been the engine of this? Um, it's kind of incomplete, but I, I guess you could draw a parallel between that and uh, the novels that he studies. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I'm not convinced though. I think it's self-protection. Well, I think it's a combination of, of, a, of a certain kind of presumption that she wants, I agree with Pierre, that she is, she, she wants to distinguish herself from all her rivals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And she knows that she can't do that except by withdrawing. Because if she plays the game, she's, uh, she's in for a disappointment. It's dangerously close to a romantic stance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, maybe we can open it up because a lot of people here that... Uh, there is something very striking I found in this novel, very different from any novel that I've read. Uh, it's a vagueness of a lot of things. The notion of time, for instance, you don't know if it's taking place in the spring or in the fall. You don't know how long the action takes. Uh, the description of the characters is also very vague. Uh, you, you know, they are beautiful, they have a lot of wit, but you don't know if they have long nose, or whether the color of their hair, the dress they are wearing, so you will never recognize them in the streets. And also, the, uh, there is no description of where the action takes place. You know, it's in the Louvre and Coulomier. Uh, Coulomier has a short description, probably the only one I found. You know, you never know in what room it takes place except the bedroom, but you know, what does the bedroom look like? You have no clue. And I was wondering if you have any comment on that, ab about this vagueness, which is very, very different from uh, you know, pretty much any novel uh, uh, that at least I've read. Yeah. It's actually uh, common to all of the novels of, uh, on you have to wait until you arrive at the 19th, in the 19th century to have novels where you have, uh, I mean, the two pillars of the 19th century novel is the portrait. So you have, uh, you know, very uh, precise description of, of, of the uh, characters, and then you have a uh, description. So you have, you very well aware of, uh, of, of the places where it, in, in which they evolve. But for all of the novel, the, pre the, the novel that precedes this particular century, you know, and this is the innovation of the 19th century novel, you you won't get any any of that. You you you'll have a very very tiny detail, but you don't have uh, the um, you don't have any uh, any uh, effort uh, to uh, come close to um, the uh, effect of real, which is another nineteenth century trope uh, that you will get in the in the uh, you know in the novel of the nineteenth century. So the the answer is uh, unfortunately rather simple. So, you know, she's blonde. Uh, I think there is a reference to her blonde hair. Well, I think you use the term of this kind of collision of hyperbolic beauty. And so I think yeah. that in terms of the descriptions of the characters, I think kind of that would be the way we could describe it is there's a lot of kind of hyperbole of the most beautiful, the most witty, the most charming, but you don't get, you know, much granular detail aside from that. Yeah, uh, because there was not in the, in the uh, poetics of the, of, the, of the early novel, uh, this um, this challenge of reality that you will have in the 19th century. So John Bender is here. I know that this is his favorite novel. I'd like to hear from John. Well, thank you for your remarks. It's uh, it's been a while since I read the book, so you brought back some moments, but. Um, it seems to me a commonplace to say that this is a novel in which interior thought is brilliantly displayed. And I just wondered if uh, Cleo Pierre could um, point out a passage that would be particularly uh, striking in this regard. There, there are many late in the novel in which there's mm -hmm. this tortuous uh, thinking and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, to me, those are my favorite passages uh, in the novel. And um, uh, as I recall, there's an important scene in the garden where this kind of rich thinking occurs uh, on the part of the princess uh, as she approaches a crisis over uh, whether to tell her husband about the affair. In a way, this is unfair because you've, um, I haven't 
pointed to any specific passages. But, um, yeah, but I think Chloe b quoted the one where she is shocked to realize that she actually is jealous uh, when she thinks oh yeah. that he's yeah. the addressee of the letter, no? Yeah, before, right. the, yeah, so the, do, yeah the, it's... 92 or yeah, 90. so around, it, that begins around page 71 and 72. So that's when she, you first kind of get these Im details about her jealousy, and then she reflects even more deeply about it on 91 and 92. Um, I don't know if we should reread that. We already read it, but... Um, yeah. I mean, traditionally, if one says this is the first modern novel or one of the first modern novels, this would be the reason, would be this <coughs> really profound exploration of the inner worlds of the characters, which is there in the 19th century novel as well, admittedly with these other features. Though you could say the same thing about uh, Jane Austen, Pierre. Yeah. We have no idea of the color of any dress Emma wears. Um, we have you know, no idea of what the tea service looks like, <laughs> and so forth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, she, uh, yeah, she's... Well, um, fill that in. <laughs> yeah, that makes her a, um, an authentic sort of 18th century novelist in that sense. Yeah. I'm sorry, if we have a question here, yeah. I was just wondering if you could comment for a minute. I'll for a minute, um, there's so much secrecy in the romances that everybody tries to keep quiet, but there doesn't really seem to be um, a penalty, even for the women, um, if they're found out. And yet there's that one small little story that Mary Queen of Scots says about the English court where you know indiscretions are met with divorce and, and death. And yet they never seem to, they're, li they're like two, in two separate stories. Maybe, maybe that's the difference between the English and the French. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know? Um, uh, and Henry VIII uh, is a, um, is a, uh, has all these dalliances, but uh, uh, indeed, uh, uh, his brutality as, as a libertine, we could, we could call him like that, is uh, very unlike the the French, you know, um, the French cohabitate better with uh, libertinage. They're known for that, and uh, that continues. Well, that's what made the princess's behavior so strange to, for example, her even just her contemporary readers in the 17th century, because, you know, you see the princess in the middle of all these court intrigues, and everyone's having an affair, and yet she won't, you know, act on this affair not only in during you know, her husband's lifetime, but even after his death when she's a widow. And so that's what was seen as very peculiar by her readers. And I think even for us today, it's, it's difficult to kind of to stomach the ending where she's, there's no moral obstacle to her marrying Namur, and yet she still doesn't go there. Yeah, and there would, there would be um, uh, writer, uh, writers that would like to pro provide a different ending. <laughs> Uh, to the one uh, written by Madame de Lafayette because they thought it was so absurd. Uh, okay, we have one behind. The microphone is coming, yeah. Thank you. Um, that was quite a rich uh, presentation and led to a, a question. There were a number of comments about the newness of this novel and what it kind of ushered in and, and, and how it kind of played out over time. And what I, what I was wondering, and, and I'm kind of new to this field, and so maybe it's obvious to you, but um, did, this, did this book and these conflicts and the way it was presented set up kind of a new standard of behavior for society? Or was it kind of just, a, you know, a, a, just a different interpretation or, or an accentuated interpretation of kind of existing standards? Particularly with the withdrawal, you know. The I mean, I think that there were some, I don't think it had an effect in terms of changing any social behaviors. I think that it did have some resonances with um, this kind of strand of Christianity of Jansenism at the time, in which there was a very austere morality and this idea that, um, so the, in a way, so the princess's renunciation of fashion in the end could be seen through that lens of kind of this austere 
virtue, um, which was kind of, you know, you know, Hasin also was, you know, had that influence as well. But in terms of actually changing social behaviors, I think not so much. I mean, even in terms of, you know, changing like literary behaviors, I think that would also be a stretch. But you mentioned uh, the fact that the Mercure Galant, you know, had this sort of poll yes. uh, uh, asking people where where they stand with regard to uh, the decision of, uh, <laughs> of of Madame de Cleve. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, it seems to me, and this may be a little provincial of, of me, that that having gotten herself into this marriage, that she might have made more of an effort to make a success of it. I, I, I mean, uh, in part of the world, they have arranged marriages, and 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 love is supposed to come later. And also, uh, I, I don't want to call it duty, but when you sign up to be married, you kind of sign up to have sex. And it doesn't look like she's had any. Right. Um, and so that seems strange to me. My question is: Is this would that appear to be strange to the the readers of the book, the original readers of the book? And what would seem stranger, that she didn't do that or that she didn't act like the rest of the court and go around having affairs? I, I think let, that let me say I don't something agree with that. Pierre that, they, that it's an unconsummated marriage. It's no I, uh, that's not what I said. We, well, we, there is no proof anyway in the There's in no the proof. Novel. No, there's no you proof. You know, because technically they, they would have had children. They don't. Uh, so, uh, but I think what is clear in the novel, though, with beyond the uh, the husband saying beyond, and so on, and and and, but she may be guilty of the uh, Christian trappings about marriage, which has a very uh, this Michel Foucault wrote on that in one of the, one of his last seminars uh, about uh, the way uh, Tertullien, you know, the father of the church. Um, uh, conceives of, of marriage. And um, sex, even in the marriage, is considered uh, too much. Uh, the, 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 what is, uh, 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 what is of, of the order of too much. And it, 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 it was, this is the reason why I, I, I insisted on the more, because when I was reading uh, uh, Michel Foucault on, on, on Christian marriage and the, uh, uh, the, the danger that sex always represents in Christian marriage, uh, uh, I kept thinking about La Princesse de Clèves. And she says to the husband, I don't know if you, if you were sensitive about those passages, she says to him, um, what do you want me to do? Uh, I believe that I am doing as much as I can. Uh, and um, she sees, I think, libido as a, uh, as a space of, 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 of danger and, um, and uh, of, of danger. And, 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 um, and um, and, and sin. So in, in the end, um, we are left with a, a union which is where there is uh, nothing. But what's interesting is that I think what makes Monsieur de Clave kind of a very peculiar husband for the time is that from the very beginning, what's a really important aspect to him is that the princess truly loves him. And so for example, on page 22, right after they get married, it says, the status of husband gave him greater privileges, but the place he held in his wife's heart was no different. It also came about in this way that although he was her husband, he did not cease to be her lover, since he always had something to desire beyond possession. So I think that that passage implies that you know, he had the rights of a husband, there was possession, but you know, he, what he wanted was he wanted for there to be kind of a complicity and a communion of, of sentiment. There is possession, but there is no desire. Mm -hmm. There's no passion. For, for especially from the part of her. Well, he has a passion for her up till the end. And to and the end. So it's asymmetrical in that regard. Yes. And, and what's, what's lacking from her part is libido, desire. For him. What's lacking from her part 
She no, he has plenty. Yes, but she lacks libido she, for him, not necessarily for Nemur. No. Yeah. No, no. With Nemur, everything's fine. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> they write a letter <laughs> <laughs> together. <laughs> uh, yeah, but we have to remember that you know it, the the prince de Clèves is not even the second or third choice. He's like the fourth or fifth choice because the mother bombs out. She, she's trying much higher than the prince de Clèves, and he is like a last resort. And uh, well, but 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 it's for reasons of alliances and, yes, it and, could and be. money. But her mother's disappointment. If one wanted to over psychologize, her her mother's disappointment in the final selection could have been transferred to the daughter, so that he said, "Well, I'm I'm getting you know uh, a last resort kind of husband, and it's, it's not ideal for you know inciting a passion for him." <laughs> and we're we're talking about a culture that for centuries has seen an incommensurability between romantic love and marriage. You go back to the Middle Ages. You, you can read The Art of Courtly Love by Andreas Capellanus, and they, uh, the whole court of the Marie de Champagne, they're, they're, they're sitting there debating whether love is possible within a, the bounds of marriage. And all of them come to the consensus that it's impossible because marriage is a contract, comes with a set of obligations, it requires the submission of the wife to the, to the husband, whereas love must be freely given and it has to be outside of, uh, you know, the whole social contract, and therefore, love is, by definition, adulterous. And she is, in that sense, the princess is just the heir of a very long tradition that has taken marriage to be the most hostile institution to romantic love. Uh, yeah, it, it's it, the uh, the thing that is that in this novel never has it been, s been developed in such a tortured way. Right. You know, like when we read, Monsieur de Clèves saw all too well how far she was from having the kind of feelings that would satisfy him, since it seemed to him that she did not even understand what they were. Right. I would go for the Madame de Temine or whoever. I, I, I think she's much more giving and generous and, and much more alluring than this prince, this cold fish who's really <laughs> not you don't want you don't, want you don't want Diane de Poitiers? No. She'll, she'll take she, care of you. She, she, she <laughs> <laughs> she's a little de trop. <laughs> de trop. <laughs> Too much. Um, coming back to this notion of libido, I think in, in the French, I'm sorry, I don't have the English translation, but in the French um, version, one word that is really, for me, the equivalent of the libido is inclination, whereas uh, we see often um, La Princesse, she feels esteem for her husband, mm -hmm. whereas he has inclination. That's so right. So perhaps that could be one of the terms. I, I, right. I don't know how that was put in the English version. And my question is, could we maybe look for some clarification in some of, other, uh, some of the other works by Madame de Lafayette. I'm thinking of La Princesse de Montpensier, where we have basically the same exact scenario, but on a smaller scale. And we see, um, you asked the question whether um, La Princesse made the right choice and why she made the choice to reject uh, de Nemours. We see um, the example of Le Duc de Guise in La Princesse de Montpensier, who the minute when he sort of obtained what he wanted from La, La Princesse de Montpensier, he turns around and goes and marries somebody else. So <laughs> perhaps we could see sort of an explanation in that, and of course there's La Comtesse de Tombe, but uh, mm -hmm. so it seems to be something that obsessively comes back in the works of Madame de Lafayette, and I'm curious whether you have any thoughts on that. Uh, I, I have to admit that I haven't reread the two, uh, Comtesse de Tante, not Princesse de Montpensier. So, um, you know, I don't want to venture to, uh, to give an answer that would not be, would not be right. Um, but that more, but, uh, that but inclination but is a great word. Yes, no, yes. Because it, you're inclined towards, it's, uh, yeah. And one of the first instances were in very early on where we find out that the princess uh, starts to kind of develop feelings for Nemours before she even fully realizes that there's a sentence that says that she noticed that he liked her because she had this 
particular inclination for him that made her particularly attentive to his behavior. And so that's kind of why she notices it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, if there's one more question, we have time for it. Um, yes, here we go, Mary. Or is that you? Well, I was struck by the participation of the men in all the in a lot of the gossip at the court. Because in the modern novels that we have today that are sort of chick not chick lit or whatever you want to call it, um, you don't really, the male characters are really just sort of there. Whereas in this, in this novel, the men were full participants in a lot of the, and, and, and what you were talking about with the secrets and wanting to make sure that they looked as if they were sharing in what was being spoken about. And I wonder if you have any comment about that, about why the men were more active on this level. I, I, you know, uh, my suspicion, I don't know what you think, but <laughs> I, if, so I'm gonna take a roundabout way of answering the question. If you read Freud on civilization and its discontents, where he has this theory that in order for societies to cohere, you have to, um, the libido, the, the, the libido of, of people cannot be overly um, uh, permissive, in, in, but because the, the libido has to, all that energy has to serve for the social cohesion of a group. And in this court setting where you have a limited number of people and it's a privileged class, aristoc aristocracy, I think that, that the libido is general. It's promiscuously distributed among everyone. And therefore, the men as well as the women are full participants in, in that circulation. And that, that's why I think the affair is not only, is your, your earlier question about why the, the um, there's no penalty for adultery, it would almost be uh, an offense to the general libidinal economy of the group yeah. not to engage in an affair because desire is there to circulate in order to keep that, that uh, aristocracy well bonded. Uh, and, and therefore the men have to be full participants in, in this story, whereas you're right, the, the kind of um, other novels that we we're used to, we don't have the same sort of community, tight-knit, small uh, group communities. Well, I think also, if we take the character of Namur, for example, a lot of the, you know, his role and his actions in the book, you kind of come down to a, a component of kind of the chase. He, I, I think it's, it's a while in the novel before he kind of realizes that it might be really hard for him to win. And so a lot of his actions are, are kind of trying to break down the princess's kind of willpower, which, you know, I think he's very surprised. And then, and then her husband dies and he thinks, okay, finally, this is my chance. And so I think he's very surprised that, and so we get a lot of information throughout of his kind of, you know, thoughts about this, his developing feelings, his, you know, strategies. And then, you know, in the end, he, you know, he's quite dismayed. But then, as you pointed out, he does, you know, in time, his passion is quenched. And Madame de Lafayette uh, feminizes some of her yes. male characters in the novel. You know, they go crazy, uh, they are afflicted, uh, all of the, the emotions that are usually attributed to women. And, uh, uh, and she does also one thing which I think is interesting. At the end of the novel, she reverses the voyeuristic structure when Madame de Lafayette, uh, in one scene, sees Nemours lying on a bench, you know, he's passive, she's active, and, and she keeps observing him from uh, the window of a bedroom. So she becomes uh, an active voyeur, where, when in the novel, as, uh, as everybody would recognize, the great scene of voyeurism is Nemours looking at her in the, in the pavilion, and she's uh, passively uh, uh, acting a scene of uh, self-auto-eroticism. Uh, auto but at, at the end of the novel, everything's reversed. It's Madame de Lafayette who, uh, uh, de who, who uh, the Princesse de Clèves, <laughs> who uh, uh, follows uh, Nemours and then sees him sleeping on a bench. You know, he becomes the the one who is uh, in a 
in sort of in the passive erotic uh, position, and she observes him also from a window in her bedroom. But and the ultimate thing that he, she does to him is basically to uh, we we could read we could read what she does to Nemour at the end as a kind of a great gesture of castration. So um, last, last question, yeah, yeah, there we go. So you've mentioned uh, morality as being one reason for her refusal. You've mentioned uh, her distinguishing herself as, as another, but it seems to me that maybe a third is uh, her guilt at not being able to return to her husband, you know, the, the honorable feelings that he had toward her. And, and that would explain why even after, and especially after his death, that she wouldn't carry out uh, you know, what, what comes from her emotions. Can you comment? Well, I agree with you. I mean, when I spoke of the phantom of the husband and the phantom of duty, that's, that's more the mother. But um, the, um, yeah, it's, it, it, of course, yeah, it does have to do with, with uh, indeed, some, some, some degree of guilt. And uh, she, when she, when she revives the husband at the end of the novel, she only speaks uh, of him in terms of dread. And we could see, yeah, we could easily see guilt behind that. Um, that's what I would. That's what I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And then I think you know the fourth component would also be what we talked a little bit about earlier, which is this element of self-protection and protecting herself from the future disappointment, which she finds inevitable. I'd like to thank our participants, Chloe Edmondson and Pierre Saint Amand from Yale, and <laughs> the, um, <laughs> looks like we're going to continue next year with another look. And we have, uh, if the book is still in print, we have a good one for the fall, but we can't announce it yet because we don't know <laughs> if it's in print or out of print yet, but stay tuned, it will be a good one, one way or another. Thanks for coming, see you next time.